In this video, we solve problem 11.10.066 from the Larson and Edwards Calculus Early Transcendental Functions text, seventh edition. We're asked to use series to approximate the definite integral i to within the indicated accuracy. So we've got a, uh, an integral, a definite integral like this, and we're asked to use series to approximate it. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna find an infinite series that represents um, the value of this integral. And we can do that pretty easily by finding a series that represents our integrand and then anti-differentiating it and then pl plugging in the upper bound and lower bound and subtracting by the fundamental theorem. And that's gonna give us an infinite series representing this guy. Now, if we want to approximate that infinite series to with an error less than 0.001, all we have to do is compute the partial sums of that series and find two consecutive partial sums that have a difference that is less than 0 0.001. So um, let's, let's do that. That's one way of approaching this problem. And the first thing that we'll do in order to evaluate this as an infinite series is we'll find an infinite series representing the integrand. Uh, the easiest way to find a series representing this integrand is to use a series for e to the x and then make a substitution. Now, if you don't remember the Maclaurin series for e to the x, it's actually really easy to derive. So we're, I'll say state or derive the Maclaurin series for e to the x. I say it's easy because remember what Maclaurin series are. And e to the x actually converges to its Maclaurin series. So we can put an equal sign there. It's the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of the nth derivative of our function evaluated at zero over n factorial times x to the n. And this is where f is just another name for our function, which is e to the x. The only unknown here is the value of that derivative at x equals zero. And it's actually really easy to find. If f of x equals e to the x, what's f prime? It's obviously e to the x. f double prime is also e to the x. And so we can see the pattern. It's actually a really simple pattern. The nth derivative of f at x is e to the x. And if we evaluate this at zero, we just have e to the zero, which is one. So this is equal to one. So that means our Maclaurin series for e to the x is this. One times x to the n, which I could just bring that x to the n. I could write it as itself over one and multiply straight across, which is giving me x to the n over n factorial. So this series, which we can expand in this way, it's one plus x plus x squared over two factorial, which is just two plus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial. This is e to the x. Now, if you want, you could have just stated this if that was something that you had committed to memory, um, or of course you could have derived it the way that I did. Now we have another theorem um, that we uh, looked at in the videos and it basically said that if you have a series that converges on some interval, you can replace the x with a continuous function of x and the new series will converge on an interval where um, that continuous function of x, well, is on the original interval of existence for the original series. Um, that wasn't 100% clear. So let's see, e to the x equals this, and this actually converges for x on the interval from negative infinity to infinity. Now that was just something that um, I remembered, but if you wanted to, you could just use the um, ratio test to prove that if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus one over a sub n in absolute value, um, that will 
always um, be less than one. And so this will converge to e to the x, it turns out, all the time. Well, it converges all the time. And then there's another thing that we could do to prove that it converges to e to the x all the time. Um, so back to what I was saying about continuous functions. If we have a series like this and it converges for all x in this interval, if I replace this x with a continuous function, like the negative x squared that we have there, then this is actually true. E to the negative x squared is just given by this series. I replace the um, x with negative x squared. And if you want, you can simplify that. The nth power applies to the negative one and the x squared. Which expands in this way. We'll have one uh, minus x squared plus x to the fourth over two uh, minus, sorry, x to the sixth over three factorial plus x to the eighth over four factorial and so on. So it's just replacing all of these x's with uh, negative x squared. We would get this. So notice that the powers of x are even this time, got a two, a four, a six, and an eight. And now they're alternating because I replaced the x with a negative x squared. <coughs> so this is an infinite series for this. And this infinite series converges as long as um, negative x squared is on the interval from negative infinity. And of course, negative x squared is on the interval from negative infinity to infinity whenever x is on the interval from negative infinity to infinity. So this guy converges to that um, for all real numbers. Okay, so that is how we derive the infinite series for this e to the negative x squared. We're just going to take that, we're going to multiply by x cubed, and then we'll anti-differentiate it. So here's a simple version of what we did. We either state or derive the Maclaurin series for e to the x. We did that. Then we um, find um, the Maclaurin series for e to the negative x squared by substitution. Super easy. And then we're going to multiply the series for e to the negative x squared by x cubed to find the Maclaurin series for the integrand. Okay. Now I'm explaining a lot more here, primarily because this can be confusing for many students. I know we could make a, a shorter video if there was less explanation, and it would be more straightforward, but then maybe you wouldn't know why we're doing what we're doing. And so I, I wanna make sure you understand why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, so if I take this uh, series and I multiply by an x cubed, and take that and multiply by x cubed, that and multiply by x cubed all the way across. It's like you're multiplying a pol polynomial by x cubed, but you're distributing. Um, basically all the powers of x are going to increase by three. So I'll have an x cubed, x to the fifth, x to the seventh. So instead of an x to the 2n, which is what we have right here, I'm going to have an x to the 2n plus 3. And that's consistent with our exponent properties as well. OK. And now we will evaluate this integral as a power series. So if i equals the integral from 0 to 0.5 of x cubed times e to the negative x squared, So I'm saying evaluate i and write i as a power series. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to say the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. 
So we're just gonna focus on this guy. We're gonna take the antiderivative. Uh, anti so the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of negative one to the n of an n factorial down here. And then we'll use the power rule for that x to that power. Because remember, we're anti-differentiating with respect to x. n just represents which type of, or which term we're on. For different values of n, those are, those are changing the constants. It's not changing the x's at all. So here, I'll just use the power rule. Add one to the exponent. Then I'll divide by the new exponent. And then we'll evaluate this from x equals 0 to x equals 0 0.5. At x equals 0, we just get 0. This is going to be the sum of infinitely many zeros. Look, if n equals 0, I'd have an x to the fourth over a constant. Um, and if I have an x to the fourth over a constant and I evaluate that at 0, I'm going to get 0. When n equals 1, that's going to be an x to the sixth. We'd have an x to the fourth, an x to the sixth, the next to the tenth, and so on. All of those evaluated at zero are going to give us zero. So when I plug in zero, I get zero. When I substitute in 0.5, I get this. So this is actually the power series representing that integral. OK. And now we want the value of that integral with an error less than 0 0.01. So let's expand that. We can see what I looks like. And then we'll find some partial sums. So when n equals 0, we have negative 1 to the 0 times 0 0.5 to the 4th over 0 factorial, which is 1. And then we've got 2 times 0 plus 4, which is 4 plus when n equals one, so I'll have a negative one to the first, so that'll be a negative one times 0 0.5. If n is one, we'll have it at 0 0.5 to the sixth over one factorial, which is one, and two times one plus uh, four is six. When n equals, so n equals zero, n equals one. When n equals two, we've got a negative one squared, 0 0.5 to the four plus four, which is eight, over two factorial times uh, two times the quantity, two times two plus four, which is eight, minus 0 0.5 when n equals three of 0 0.5 to the 10th over three factorial times uh, the quantity two times three plus four, so six plus four, which is 10, and so on. So that's our i. Now that we've written our i, we can find the various um, partial sums of this. So the first partial sum is just the 0 0.5 to the fourth over four. The second one is 0 0.5 to the fourth over four minus 0 0.5 to the sixth over um, six. For the third partial sum, I'm, I'm just denoting it by s sub zero, s sub one, and s sub two to correspond to the n values here. It's gonna be, this'll be the sum of these three terms. Uh, we've got two times eight down there, so that's gonna be 16. This is a six times 10, which is 60. Okay, so I'm just going to use my calculator to evaluate this, these partial sums. I have 0.5 to the fourth divided by four. So I get approximately 0 0.015625. And then for the next one, I'm going to just take my last answer and subtract 0 0.5 to the sixth. 
divided by six, which gives me that as my exact answer, or approximately 0 0.01302. When I round out to, let's do one, two, three, four, five, six decimal places. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Let's do six decimal places again. Now we'll add uh, 0 0.5 to the eighth divided by 16, which is giving me 0 0.013265. And then the next one, let's subtract 0 0.5 to the 10th divided by 60. And that's 0 0.013 two, four, um, nine. So when I look at these, if I want my error, the absolute value of my error to be less than 0 0.001, I just want the um, difference between two consecutive terms to be less than 0 0.001. Or in other words, I want the first three digits of my answer to be the same from term to term. So I look at the first three digits here, the first three digits here, the first three digits here, and the first three digits here. Since this error was 0 0.001, we are correct to the first three digits um, after this one right here. Um, the 0 0.013 and 0 0.013, that doesn't change as you go from S sub one into S sub two. So that's gonna be our answer. Thank <laughs> you.